Hello and welcome. We have started 30 seconds early for our perfect blue review. And as Kat tells me, she likes it. <laughs> when we... yeah, well, you know, a, a woman likes it when you come early, right? <laughs> no. Isn't no, that how it goes? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I was no no women like it when they come early. Oh, it's that what it is. It's the other way around. See, it's, oh. it's sexist. Oh, but what if I thought that it's good for the skin, so they like it anyway. <laughs> We're not going there. So what are we? Well, tonight we are going to be reviewing with that kind of opening. We, we are going to be reviewing the anime classic from I believe 1997. Was it uh, Perfect Blue, which is labeled as a horror thriller psychological horror which it most certainly is but on another level it's more of a deep dive into the world of celebrity and pop idols mm -hmm. in japan and just how twisted and warped it can become i think also it's uh amazing how prophetic it became on uh on the internet and uh internet celebrity yeah you're right because in the film just so we everyone knows yeah as i said oh, it was wait, real quick i i think everybody already knows but um spoilers abound okay we're in, we're gonna cut loose we don't care spoilers if you haven't seen perfect blue yet well we won't no, let's not spoil the ending well we, of course not we're not total dicks but <laughs> but uh give them the basic breakdown of the plot or the, at least the opening um the the basic point or the basic plot of the film is you have a, a, a pop idol singer who is part of an up-and-coming group whose managers decided that the best way for her to um, for her career to really take off is to leave the uh, the group that she's in and become an actress and um, it's really the, uh, you know, what's the price of your soul? And she leaves the uh, very wholesome image of being a pop idol mm -hmm. in uh, this trio called Cham, mm -hmm. where while she's in the band, they have what, what they're wearing these kind of puffy pink dresses and ponytails and they're kind of dressed like tweens, aren't they? They're very cute. They're very wholesome. You definitely get kind of a Disneyland vibe off of uh, off of the way that they dress and they look. I mean, yes, there is a little bit of uh, uh, sex appeal in there, but it's very cute and innocent. Yeah, girl next door kind mm -hmm. of. And uh, the main character, Mima, leaves the group to break into acting. And in doing so, she has to shed her image as this wholesome pop star, which she wanted to do at first, it appears. Mm -hmm to uh, break into acting, and as she becomes an actress, her image starts to spiral into darker and darker places as she's asked to do more and more compromising things. Uh, meanwhile, the pop band she was in takes a slightly more mature image. They start dressing more like they're in their late teens or early 20s. Mm -hmm. Their sound gets a little more mature, and they take off. They get huge. So, I mean... The film definitely has the message of uh, maturing, growing up, um, making more adult decisions. And I also definitely got the message of um, making your own decisions about your own life and how how that is a part of growing up too. And at the beginning, you're early, uh, early, early on, you're introduced to her manager and her agent, which are a male and a female, mm -hmm. both about the age that would be right for her parents. Mm -hmm. And they do seem to have parental roles to some degree. Mm -hmm. And the male, I believe the agent, yeah, um, is all for having her ascend into a career of being an actress where the manager, which is this very matronly looking woman, wants her to stay in this child, um, wholesome, good girl. Well, I, I think more than that, because the agent, uh, he, for, for one thing, what I really liked about the agent is that, yes, he is cutthroat. He is about the bottom line. He is about the business, but he's not without a soul. Um, I did really like that, but just like a a good father figure, 
he also is not going to um, shy away from pushing limits, pushing boundaries, and uh, encouraging uh, Mima to you know, step out of her comfort zone and try new things where the uh, the manager, the, the more matronly, wants her to stay a child is constantly saying, you know, no, Mima's not an actress. Mima is still this pop idol. Mima is basically still a kid. Yet Mima does want to be an actress. Mm -hmm. She just doesn't seem to know what the price of that is going to be. No, she doesn't. Um, at the beginning, you get several shots of the fantasy of uh, youth entertainment. I mean, it actually starts out with this live show of a Power Rangers type program. And then it segues over into after the Power Rangers show is over uh, to her, her band Cham performing. And throughout it, everything's brightly colored. Everything feels very safe. But in the audience, there are rabble rousers. Mm -hmm. There uh, is already fanboys who were beginning to troll and start rivalries and well, essentially fuck things up. Actually, um, for um, all those uh, creators out there who are writers, that opening scene I thought was perfect because of how much it conveyed without full on telling you, without you know, somebody doing an exposition dump. And the big one is you have a troop of these teenage rabble rousers. In fact, later you find out one of them was specifically 18 years of age. And it's them sitting on a park bench uh, talking about this, this music group that she's a part of. And they're kind of talking trash where it's like they're saying that they're fans of hers, but yet they're talking trash about her. And right next to them is a poster for her band uh, and they are the headliners of the attraction that's at this park that they're all in with down in the tiny corner the um, the Power Rangers type group that that the movie just opened up with they're in the tiny corner so they're not the headliners they're not the main attraction it's Mima's group is the main attraction. But the fact that the opening act was a, a, a Super Sentai yeah. performance shows the age group that she was aimed at, mm -hmm. yet these guys are, what, 18, 17, moving into their 20s, Yes, still following her around. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're really critical. I mean, really, they are the archetypical bad fan. Yeah, they are. They truly are. And I mean, they do other things during her performance that show that, yet they keep showing up. Right. Now, breaking away from that opening scene where you first get the sense of the illusion of wholesomeness and the stress of the world behind it, and then the reality of the audience where you've got all these kids enjoying it and then these older fans that are fucking it up, it transitions over to her acting career. And up till this point, everything happening is very clear cut. There's a very clear divide between reality and performance. And as you see the performance at the beginning, it keeps intercutting with Nima's day-to-day -day life, shopping, cleaning her apartment, feeding her fish. And it's very mundane, but the colors, you can very, very easily tell just by the colors alone, what is real and what isn't, mm -hmm. what's performance. And there's no question what is fantasy and what is the day-to-day -day life of the real Mima. Well, also um, her being in this band, she can have a regular day-to-day -day life. Right. You know, she can just go to the store, buy groceries just like normal people. And that's not a big issue. And yes, she did have a couple of people recognize her, give her fan mail, but overall she had a normal life. But the moment she enters into the acting career and where it's far more seedy and they're starting, she gets onto this law and order police pro procedural type show about a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And they start asking her to do things she's uncomfortable with, like the uh, simulated rape scene. And, yeah. and the interesting thing is once that happens, you start having this increasingly uh, escalating sequences of you would open to a scene and it would seem like it's her day-to-day -day life and she's talking about things that really do sound like it's her life. 
And then you pull back and it's a television screen and you realize it's the show. And this mm -hmm. keeps happening. It starts happening more and more as the film uh, proceeds um, down to suddenly she starts having a stalker fan who seemingly wants to kill her. Yet the TV show also is about a stalker killing women. Mm -hmm. And so the dialogue, it's often- uh, Specifically a celebrity. Yeah, uh, yeah, a former model mm -hmm. who tries to get into acting. Yeah. And so often there'll be scenes where you think she's acting and then you pull back and you realize, no, this is her real life. Or there'll be scenes where you think, she's, oh, she's seeing a psychologist for the problem she's in, or she's talking to the police and it'll pull back and it's the TV show. And one thing I really, really appreciated about this film is doing where doing scenes where reality breaks up or you can't tell what's real and what's reality anymore is very hard and extremely, extremely difficult to do and have it continually uh, ring true and to not have the audience get pissed off and find it tedious. You know, the third time you you wake up it and you have a uh, um, Groundhog Day syndrome. Yeah. Uh, well, see, originally when you start getting the, the bleeding of reality and the televised or, you know, yeah, acted out fantasies of entertainment, there's for a, for a long while, it's strictly cutting to life and what's on the screen or on the set. Mm -hmm. But after a while, reality starts to get questionable and then she keeps just waking up in bed. Mm -hmm. And so now you don't even know if it's a dream, it really happened or part of the show. And that is another part of it because I definitely had the, I know it's kind of become a cliche, but I think this was done very well. Almost the uh, Alice through the looking glass um, yeah. metaphor where a lot of what was not real you saw behind glass either in the TV or out a window or you know it through her reflections she you know if it wasn't actually physical in her you know, with her it's all in the reflection well every time she's questioning her actions or who she is there's a reflection of her somewhere in the room. If it's her leaning on a window or her looking into a mirror or uh, just what, what was it even on once on water, mm -hmm. there was water on the ground. And you, it, when she's questioning herself, there's always a reflection. And as time goes on and she starts to kind of seem to be losing her mind, the reflections start turning into her old pop idol self and taunting her and mm -hmm. criticizing her. And you don't even know if that's happening or not. No. No, you don't. And uh, again, it's the very well done metaphor of going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just uh, one thing that I caught was that the uh, police procedural that she's a part of, that she got a role on as mm -hmm. an actress is a bit part. And by the way, she starts out as a bit part just to show up in one episode, and she ends up becoming a major part of the plot mm -hmm. as the writer decides, oh, well, she's willing to compromise and uh, simulate a rape. Okay, I'll write more scenes for him. And they just, scenes for Mina, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, but the show was called Double Bind. And I've got to wonder if, and it, in the, it wasn't just English, I mean, on screen, and on the slates, it said in English, double bind. Mm -hmm. So that was specific what they meant. Yes. And that sounds to me like a play on the uh, scientific empirical phrase, double blind. That's what I was wondering, if, yeah. if, if that's what they were uh, referring to. And of course, the principle of a double blind test is you get two people or two or more observers that uh, one is the test subject and one is the control and neither know of each other. Mm -hmm. Hence, double blind. Yeah. And I don't think that was a coincidence. I don't think so either. Um, and the show is the first place that you get the uh, mentioning of reality and illusion where Mima is in a scene where she's talking to a psychologist and the psychologist uh, says to her, well, she says, I don't know if this stuff's really happening. 
and um, where's the line? Uh, I can't find it. Oh, there it is. First, she says, I don't, uh, I don't think, I'm not sure what I even think anymore, right? And then there's something to the uh, line, something to the effect of, well, illusions can never become real. Yeah. And then the, as over time, that starts to change. Well, you know, illusions can become real. Which... Yeah. Is what, what was the manager said that? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Um, also, there's a, an ongoing theme where she has these fish in her apartment. Mm -hmm. They're guppies. They're guppies. Yeah. And uh, did you notice the color scheme? Yes, of the guppies? they were all red and blue. Yes. And um, early in the film, she apologizes to her fish for not feeding them on time. That she was busy and she feeds them. Then after she does the rape scene for the television show, she comes home and all the fish in her tank are dead. And she flips out and she starts breaking down. And that's the moment she really begins to crack and change. And then she comes out of her breakdown and the fish are still alive, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Um, now, the, now, I think we've gone uh, far enough into this to bring up the title, Perfect Blue. And from what I can take from it, there definitely is a color language in the background. And there are a lot of blue tones throughout it. But every time things start getting screwed up, there's red. And when things are getting really screwed up, there's a f red flashing light mm -hmm. somewhere in the scene. And... What I took from it to mean is when the scenes were all in blue sapia, that was really her. That's what I think that meant. So that was kind of the code to the re, uh, uh, viewer. And that's what I took from it, too. Um, oh, okay, good. Uh, especially when you consider the, uh, uh, the rabbit persona always was in pink. Until oh, the she, doppelganger, her, yeah. her uh, doppelganger? Mm -hmm, until she was in red. Yeah, she was in pink, and then she was in red. Also, uh, the uh, she's always wearing that that wholesome outfit that uh, uh, Mima wore. The Bob Idol yeah, outfit. And I thought it was very interesting that the outfit that she wears in the uh, simulated rape scene for the television show is very reminiscent of that outfit, and it's torn off of her. Right. And the outfit was primarily white with a hint of red. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the rape scene. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, just uh, by the way, for all of you in the chat, we will answer questions. Uh, we're going to do that at the end of the show, though, unlike our usual back and forth with the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to do the review first, and then we will we will definitely get to your questions. Yes, most definitely. Um, so, let's see. So, anyway, as her career moves on, and she starts becoming controversial for then doing the rape scene, then she does a new photo shoot mm -hmm. for essentially like a Playboy type magazine. Well, what I took from that was, um, I, I, again, this whole process of something that's fantasy coming into reality. Uh, you know, she she agrees to do this rape scene um, for the show because even to for herself, she says. You know, it's not real. It, it's it's not real. It's not like they're actually going to be raping me. Um, you know, and I need to be doing these sorts of scenes anyway if I'm going to be an actress, right? And she was <laughs> even saying, "Well, I need to change my image." Yeah, you know, and I need to change my image. I need to to show the world what I can do. And yes, it's very obvious she wasn't comfortable with the idea, but she did it. And yes, she did regret doing that scene. But she still did it, and she went through it, and she didn't at any point let it be known to those around her how much she hated doing it. But then the fact that they didn't have her do this photo shoot, and what I liked about that was she's told she's going to be doing this photo shoot, and you hear other people talk about how this photographer has a reputation of getting girls to get naked. You, the audience, hear this information, and it's assumed she may or may not know 
we don't know. That's not the point. The point is that now it's reality. It's no longer pretend. And you slowly watch her strip for this photo shoot for this photographer who is kind of a sleaze bag. And then later you see the photo spread in the magazine that they are published in. And yes, it's tasteful. It's like, that's what I thought was interesting is they very easily could have had it like a hustler type magazine where it's just trashy as all hell. Yeah. But what I thought was interesting is even though the photographer seemed kind of slimy and dirty, mm -hmm. the photo shoot was actually really classy and nothing I think anyone would, should be yeah. ashamed of. I mean, it, it reminded me of some of the uh, the, the pictures that uh, that you've shown me of not of the, the idols. Yeah, of the graver. Yeah, idols. the idols are the really high quality. I mean, it's so yeah, it was very interesting. Is I would full on say that the photos that were taken of her definitely fall in the line of erotic art. It yes. wasn't porn. No, it wasn't. But it's the fact that now it it's no longer her hiding behind the veneer of a character on a on a show, you know, being you know being stripped naked and raped. Now it's her and nothing else behind you know, you know hiding that she can hide behind it's her naked in a magazine and her and that um cascade i thought that was very interesting and uh, what i was going to get to is that the fanboys the fuck up her concert at the beginning of the movie who we also see later talking shit about her mm -hmm. but yet they're fans of her yeah then it shows them buying the magazines and talking among themselves, talking about a whore and a slut she is, and and yet, what do they do? They spend all their time reading the fan website that has been created that looks like she's the one who created it, but they don't know that. But they spend all their time reading that website and going through the nudes and going through the nudes, yeah. And yeah, she uh, she's um, this is in ninety seven, so. For those of you who uh, did not remember those dark days of uh, pre-cable uh, internet. Yes, the uh, dark days. <laughs> the dark days of AOL and Angel Fire oh. and Netscape. Or, yeah, Netscape. I just remember I did have a website in 97. I did have my own website. I built it myself. I coded it myself. I put everything up there myself. And it was shit tons of animated GIFs and MIDI music because that was the cool thing back then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were hot shit if you had animated GIFs. But anyway. Oh, I, I had shit tons of animated GIFs. Oh, my God. Nina is totally unaware of what the World Wide Web is. She yeah. has a fan sender this. Yeah, I know that sounded like a train. Yeah, okay. what the fuck? I have no idea. I think there is a train, tra there are train tracks nearby. Uh, yeah, guy, I don't know if you guys, if you heard that, it sounded like there was a train outside our window, which was very odd. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to look out there and see a spectral ghost train passing. Dude, that would rock. Anyway. So, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mima doesn't even know what the World Wide Web is, and she has a fan say, oh, uh, this is your website, Mima's room, and she doesn't know what it is, so her um, manager comes over one day, she gets a computer, and she goes on, <laughs> and at first she thinks it's cute, Yes. but then she starts to get freaked out that this website is written as if it's her. And they know way too much about her life. Well, that's the other thing, going back to the, the questioning self with this film, is she's reading these, these blog entries on this site, and, and she's laughing and thinking it's fun. And then she goes, wow, this person really knows me. Until the reality starts dawning on her. This how do person... they know what foot I use to step into the bath first? Yeah. How, how do they know that? Or, or stepping off the, um, you know, her superstition about uh, which foot she yeah. uses to step off the, uh, the subway. How do they know what I was shopping for today? <laughs> yeah. Or, and uh, you're, the, you'll start seeing pictures of her about town doing random things. And it's these like candid shots, but yet they look almost posed. And it's her having this horrible realization that somebody's following her, but at the same time, she doesn't. She questions whether or not it's her who's doing this. She doesn't know. 
I thought also what was really interesting was the very first time you see her question who she is. I don't know, even know who I am anymore. Mm -hmm. It comes off as a very genuine scene of her being in serious doubt of who she is, if she's really lost herself in this new acting role. It really comes across as that. And then you pull back and it's a scene for the TV show. Mm -hmm. And at the, the, the beat, right when it pulls back, the line is, there's, there's no way illusion can become reality. Right when the camera pulls back and you see, wait, it's a TV show. Yeah. And then the uh, writer of the TV show who scripted the scene where she's raped gets murdered outside, outside his job. But how specifically was he murdered? First, uh, he gets drawn into an elevator that has a stereo uh, boombox in it blasting her uh, music mm -hmm. when she was in a pop band. And then he has his eyes gouged out. Yep. Um, and uh, I don't know if this was done on purpose. I have a feeling it was. Um, for those of you who may not know, in Japan, they have the same uh, uh, superstition about numbers that Americans do, where we have a thing with 13. So you'll find older buildings that don't have a 13th floor on them. Uh, they yeah, still still a reality. No, it is still a reality. They very strongly have that with the number four, and that's because the the number four, uh, which in Japanese is she, is death, and so they will not have a fourth floor in buildings. If you have like room numbers or you know, apartment numbers, you will not find four, uh, and so he. This guy was dropped off on in the elevator on floor number five because there is no fourth floor. And I just thought that was interesting that they did that. Um, one, one thing also just to bring up, uh, one of the very first scenes, again, going towards her changing her image, becoming somebody else, you know, even growing up somewhat, uh, is you get the scene of looking at her room in her apartment, her tiny little apartment. Her apartment has an entryway and that's about it. <laughs> and that was kind of an indicator of even though she's in this pop band, they're not big enough to be making much money. No. I mean, she's in a, t a her apartment was smaller than our old house in San Diego, which yeah. was ridiculously small. She has a, a room for her bed with her TV and her dresser, and then she has a tiny little balcony, and that's about it. She may have a sink. No, she does. She has one of those uh, those uh, sink, toilet, tub combinations um, that they have because it, it's a very small amount of space. But otherwise, she's cramped in there, and that tiny room is filled with toys and dolls lots of dolls and it a teddy bear in the background always yeah there's always this teddy bear in the background and uh novel novelty pillows that look like hearts i it's it's a teenager's room really uh and one of the first things we see her do uh as now that she's not in part of this band is there's a poster of the band on the wall and she takes it down. She rolls it up and she takes it down and says, okay, girls, that was a great show, but now it's time for all of us to go home. And she rolls she rolls up her friends, basically, um, and puts them away. And she never interacts with them again. At least I don't think so. Um, well, she does. Uh, she goes to the radio show to see them and then she flips out and runs out of the room. But she doesn't interact with them. And then there's the uh, party that they're having because the band has suddenly hit the top charts. But she doesn't interact. Yeah, she with never them. actually speaks to them. She leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she she does not engage with them on a one to one basis ever again. So there's a scene that occurs about. I would say this was the um, indicator that the third act had started. Now the first act, in my opinion, uh, ended the moment she took the poster down mm -hmm. and really got moving uh, after the fish died. That was the change in the character. But I I really felt the third act started in that scene in which our old manager, she's sitting down with the, the, the matronly woman mm -hmm. and they're talking and the matronly manager says something like, such a mature woman now. 
is you've become such a mature woman. People like it. And she doesn't really approve. Yeah. And then Mima's holding a cup of tea. And she squeezes it so tight it bursts. And it looks like she has a stigmata. Mm -hmm. the, the cuts give her a stigmata. What the hell did you take from that? Because I really didn't see any Christ metaphor there. What what would you take from that? Uh, I didn't really see it as a Christ metaphor. I yeah, it, you. But that's usually it. It clearly wasn't. No. Um. Really, I saw that as she is so unhinged by this point because because we've now had a thing where she's become disassociated with reality. She doesn't know what day it is. She doesn't know if she's reliving something or not. She doesn't know if 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 the words that she's saying are part of a scene from the TV show that she's on, or if she's actually saying it to somebody and she's become so unhinged with reality that she breaks this cup in her hand. And when she's looking at the blood, she has no reaction to what she's just done. She doesn't feel the pain or anything. And she's just, and she full on looks at this blood and she asks her manager, is this even real? Is, yeah. is this blood even real? And then we start getting the sequences where you no longer get the, it's on screen or the pullback to indicate mm -hmm. when reality, you know, there usually it was, is this reality? And then it would pull back and it would be a TV screen mm -hmm. or you'd think it was a uh, movie and then you'd cut and you'd realize, oh wait, no, this is reality. After the uh, incident with the T and she bleeds, is when we start getting the rapid fire, something weird happens, she wakes up. Something weird happens, she wakes up. Mm -hmm. And then time starts going out of joint and events start happening out of order. And you're not sure anymore what's really happening. Did you notice that? Yeah, I did. Um, one oh, thing after, yeah. What did she say when I said time goes out of joint? Mm -hmm. When she cuts her hands, she says, was yesterday even real? Yeah. So essentially, my old life, was it even real? Is what I took that to mean. Mm -hmm. And more killings occur. They're all connected to her, and they always go for the eyes. The eyes are always gouged out. Um, and there's even, they cut back to the show, and there's that scene where she says, am I, uh, am I, uh, um, am I really living in uh, the world I'm living in? Is it really happening? I just can't tell anymore. Yeah. Um, well, one point I would like to bring up, and I think um, uh, Super Eye Patch Wolf actually uh, brought this up. And that was this idea of uh, celebrity and you know public personality that um, invades the story and her life and what I thought was very fascinating was also that this persona that she has of who she she kind of wishes she could be or go back to and also the, this idea of fame that invades not only her life, but the internet and those around her. Uh, it's like the cult of personality is infectious and has a mind of its own. Oh, well, it does, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, it does. There definitely does appear to be a herd behavior. We, we, we've seen that in comics now, haven't we? Oh, yeah. But I, again, thought it was very fascinating that this film took into account how the internet has that effect on people and how it um, can cultivate or even create this, this cult of personality. This was back in 97, you know, how prophetic and the fact that this film holds up to this day as a result. Well, in truth, a lot of these things have been around for quite some time. It's mm -hmm. just taken different forms. And I think what made this film prophetic is the date it was made. Mm -hmm. It came out in 97, the dawn of the internet really taking hold. I mean, prior to that, it really was the realm of you know, geeks and tinkers, and it really was still very much an exclusive space. And this film really was one of the first to start factoring in 
the mass consciousness that comes with the internet. Mm -hmm. um, I would also um, have to say that by the end of it, you're really not sure who she really is. I would say there's, you start to realize there are whole segments of the film that may not have really been narrated through her eyes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And also bouncing back to the fanboys repeatedly seemed to be kind of a reflection of what public attitude was towards her as time went on. And it was weird was the worse they thought of her, the more they bought her stuff. Yeah. Did you notice that? Oh yeah, I totally The worse they thought that. of her, the better she did. And yet they also hated the uh, fanboy, uh, with Mr. M Mamara, was that his name? Um, um, it was Me Maniac. Me Maniac, yeah. Um, the fact that they hated this guy and this guy is what they pretended to be. He was, quote, a true fan. And as such, it did drive him to do insane things. Well, he was mentally ill. It was well, very obvious. He kind of had a deformed face and oh, yeah. was not all there. Another aspect that I think we need to take into account mm -hmm. is that uh, apparently the lifespan of an of a idol's career typically is very brief, no longer than three years. Yeah. And that's about the end of it. Um, and she was leaving it, which is probably the right choice because most, you know, you leave you, as soon as you're no longer that sweet, innocent teenager, you're, you're out. There's, there, you can't perform anymore unless you hit it big and now you've got a career forever. And wasn't that one thing that continually kept coming up was that people, the uh, people in the, um, uh, the TV industry were like, well, you know, why should I give her more lines? She's just, you know, yeah. she's just this idol. She's just the singer. You know, she's not going to want to do anything. She's, you know, she's going to be wholesome. And so she had to do something daring to show them all, look, I've got balls. I can, I can do this. Well, she better not have balls. That, well, that would be shocking. <laughs> well, that well, that would have been very interesting if she was a lady boy. <laughs> well, what it was, was the, um, the image she had as a pop idol mm -hmm. was you know, it relied upon her appearing young, naive, and innocent. And as long as she was that, she could be a pop idol, but she wasn't going to make it as an actress. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing that also should be brought up is actresses themselves um, usually only have a career lifespan of five to six years in Japan. Yeah. Unless, again, you hit it huge. But then again, even big names don't have a very long career. It's not like here where, uh, you know, once you get a name, you can have a career until you die. Um, yeah, celebrities are very different there. So in a sense, knowing that being a pop idol for three years and a celebrity for six is about the best damn longevity you could make career-wise mm -hmm. and increase your chances of really hitting it big and having a lifelong career. So in a sense, that was the right choice to make. Um now, I don't think we can really proceed any further without ruining the film. Would you agree? Yeah, I would just like to say um, that opening scene where she's uh, performing at the uh, park, uh, sh she's supposed to be announcing to all of her fans that this is going to be her last show. And because of some rabble rousers, she doesn't get to make that speech. She's timid and shy and she cowers and she clams up. And one of her, the w girls in her group is the one who has to say it for her. And that continues to happen until that moment when she says, okay, I'll do the rape scene. And that's when you start seeing her Take, starting to take control of her life and a, as a result, her living with the consequences yeah. of, of her making her own decisions. What's interesting is she makes that decision for the rape scene, but then she starts letting other people tell her what to do. And it's kind of this building of taking more and more risks, owning her life more and more. Mm -hmm. um, this is an excellent film. I mean, oh, yeah. this is one that we're going to get multiple viewings out of. Oh, definitely. Um, I would say the other thing about the uh, rabble rousers at the concert at the beginning, and it won the idea of rabble rousers 
at a concert for what were essentially 12 year olds. It was 12 year olds and then uh, teenage boys. Yeah. So having these older teenage boys raise hell at a concert for a bunch of 12 year olds and their moms. You know, actually, that's a very good point. There were no girls. Yeah. We, we, at, we never at any point saw any young girls, which usually these uh, these pop groups are aimed at. Oh, they were all little boys, yeah. Well, they were all teenagers. We didn't even see little boys. No, at the beginning, there were lots of children. There were there were lots of children was, in general. No, it was but... parents sitting with their children, and then there were the teenage rabble-rousers that came in. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was the rabble-rousers that came in, there were the fanboys that like talked shit about her but loved her. Mm -hmm. But the rabble-rousers that started the fight liked a different band and we're going to raise hell at her concert and start fights because they liked a different band. Yeah. Now, what does this sound like? <laughs> All sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> you so, got to really wonder what the fuck's wrong with people sometimes. It's, it's my team, your team. You're not my team. Therefore I'm going to get pissed at you. You know, there are plenty of things that I find thoroughly moronic, but I wouldn't get in a fight for it or even waste my time going to the show. Well, you're an intellectual thinker. You're not, you're A, not a team player for one, and B, you can say, yes, I may not care about this band as much as that band, but I'm not going to get pissed off because the band I don't like much is playing right now. I can go listen to my band. <laughs> I just don't understand the mentality. Of, who has the time for that kind of shit? A lot of people, unfortunately. Apparently, it just I don't get it. So I think we've given a pretty solid breakdown of the beats of the story beats of the film and mm -hmm. what we got from it. Um, I, I thought that the storytelling visually was incredibly powerful, but um, Yes, the dialogue was needed, but a lot of the changes in what was really going on in the subtext was done real well symbolically in the background, just through images. And it was done in the way that you don't even need to notice it. Your brain does mm -hmm. for it to be there, Yeah, which is the way to do it right. I mean, if a symbol's shining right out in front of you, you better be telling a parable or a fairy tale or a mm -hmm. myth otherwise. Well, but so far as she looks out her apartment window across the street and you see the other apartment building across the way, most of the windows are dark, except there are two blue windows and one red. Yeah. You know, something some something just as simple as that. And if you are just watching it, you just see three windows. But you know, if you're looking at the the color um, imagery through the film, that means something. Well, using color as a subtext in film is mm -hmm. nothing new and definitely nothing new in comics either. No. I feel these days it's being overused and used very, very poorly. I'm Night Shyamalan. Um, <laughs> well, it, it's like they they saw Suspiria and said, we're going to do that. It's like, do you even know why Suspiria has that coloring? So now <laughs> Original they, Suspiria, not the remake. Oh, the remake's really good. Oh, the remake's amazing. But I meant specifically, yeah. you know, that, that bright in your face yeah. color scheme. Uh, the giallo co color scheme yeah. that you're talking about. No, but... It's often become, it's almost become a cliche now saying, oh, well, it's got a language of color in the background. No, this film really does. It's mm -hmm. not pretentious bullshit. It functions the way it should be for a story. It's narrative. It's not artsy, art, it's not artsy bullshit. Anything that has a, that's red means something. Like, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would say that's about the end of a review unless mm -hmm. you've got anything else. No, uh, we have some good comments I've been seeing. Oh, is there uh, any specific you want to bring up? Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was, so forgive me while we find your comment. Uh, there was talk of how uh, the the next film this uh, director did, uh, Paprika, is actually the better of the two. And I'm like, the better of the two? You have me intrigued. Well, if there's <laughs> one better than this, I mean, this was such a good film. Y yeah, yeah. And also for a film that was apparently very low budget, the animation was beautiful. Oh, it was gorgeous. And uh, we got the uh, the Blu-ray. Clean. Oh, well, this is the remastered. But yeah, even a remastered Blu-ray isn't going to fix motion. 
No. Bad frame rates and bad uh, drawings are not going to be fixed by a remaster. Well, I think the only reason why it could be remastered is because it, it was such good animation to begin with. Um. Okay, so, I'm still going through here. I, I mean, there's interesting comments, but I'm not uh, really seeing anything related to uh, the film. That's okay. Well, okay, here's one, I suppose. Yeah, anxiety can make it feel like your fish just died, even when everything is fine. <laughs> you, you know, that is very, very true. Uh, that is extremely true. You know, I, I, it is not good to feel like your fish died every fucking day month. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone just willing to do a rape scene. It may not be real, but it can still make a, a mental toll on the actor actress. That's from Owen. Actually, Owen, I think I know what you're going to say. You're going to bring up uh, um, the Rita, actor? Rita Sirtis. Oh, no. Actually, why don't you bring that up after what I say? What okay. I gonna, yeah. What I thought was really interesting <gasps> yes. about the rape scene, and I really liked this, was in these woke times, the predictable portrayal would be the male actor getting off on it, which mm -hmm. is totally inaccurate. I've seen no. plenty of interviews with male actors talking about not just rape scenes, but you know, intimate scenes in general about how they're uncomfortable. Uh, what was it for THX 1138? Um, oh, where he's, uh, is it the cut scene that where he's? Uh, no, no, where the, there was the part where um, La and Thex are you know ta naked and you see her breasts mm -hmm. and he's, and uh, he said, you know, you know, I tried to be a gentleman. I mean, I'm a male and, you know, things reacted, but I really wanted to be, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And in this, in um, Perfect Blue, during the rape scene, the actor who's playing this slimy maniac raping her at a strip club, in between the takes is, I'm really sorry about this. I, I, yeah, he goes, he feels awful about it. And you can tell, he just, that, that he genuinely feels bad. The Dude. animator who got that expression so right which is hard considering the angle that it's at is more focused on her face and you just get a side shot of him and you can tell he genuinely feels bad about the scene that they're about to have and then when you see the scene it's just holy fuck <laughs> um no i i was gonna say uh owen uh, Nishi's uh, point was absolutely perfect. Um, Marita Sirtis, uh, before she was uh, Deanna Troy on uh, Star Trek Next Generation, uh, she did a lot of films, specifically one of the Death Wish films, where she got raped violently. And she said that she was just one rape after another, after another, after another. And she has said in interviews that, yes, it paid the bills, but she was so glad to get on to Star Trek because then she wasn't getting raped anymore. Well, at the convention, she actually was a little drunk and she broke down at a Q&A. Yeah. Going into tears, telling the fans how much she appreciated them because it meant she got to play a real role and she wasn't getting raped constantly in, a, in the uh, canon films. Yeah. Yeah, fucking. But I mean, she said it. that the uh, director was kind of a dirtbag. Yeah, she did. She did. And say the he was uh, a director dirt bag. refused to let her get dressed between takes. Yeah. Or even just have a blanket. Okay. Uh, exact change is an interesting comment. Uh, Japan pop idols often go on to become adult film actresses. The adult video industry there is very professional and is seen as more legit than in the West. I don't doubt that, considering you know you get fun films like uh, Sumo Vixens and uh, a, a lot of... I don't of, even know if uh, those actresses would be considered adult, though. I mean... Or IKU. Yeah, okay, IKU, definitely. Yeah, I, IKU is an art film, quite frankly. A good art film. But uh, I do know that a lot of the actresses that appear in um, uh, Tokyo Shock films mm -hmm. uh, are idols that had moved on to doing... Uh, if anything, at least soft porn. Is, I vaguely remember you telling me something about that, like for the girl who was in um, uh, Tokyo Gore Police and- No, uh, no, she didn't, she does not do porn. Um, no. Hold on, give me a question. No, I mean like like she started off being something wholesome, like a- uh, um, Not quite, but- uh, And it was so creepy, her in audition, because that that was the breakout thing with her was in audition was 
you know, the uh, torture scene. Oh my God. Um, is, uh, Ihi uh, Shina um, started out as a model in France. Oh, is that what it and was? And it was because she had, she was slender and she had such a unique look. Mm -hmm. And I forget who was a huge photographer scouted her. And apparently to this day, she still does model shoots for money. But that um, it was just by chance that she tried out for a role and got it uh, with uh, Mike. Oh, okay. And uh, she, she's interesting. I, I, I should show you a few of her interviews. And then um, really, I don't think Gork Police would even be half as good if she had not starred in it. I agree 100%. Actually, I think it probably would have been a terrible film if it wasn't for her. Well, she brought the humanity to it. I mean, the film it has a great story and the effects are insane, but without her actually grounding it, it just would have come off as goofy. There are a few actresses I think could have pulled it off. That, um, oh, the, the... But you were thinking as uh, for the uh, woman who did um, uh, sumo vixens, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Kay... Uh, Mizutai. Yeah. Um, uh, oh God, I'm butchering it. I'm I'm I, I am a disgrace. <laughs> but uh, K uh, Mizutani. That's it. K Mizutani. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if she can. You can consider her porn. She does nude photography, but and some nude videos. But primarily, she does. She did these kind of weird, uh, soft uh, core uh, Tokyo Shock films that were more silly than anything. And mm -hmm. then, of course, the amazing, amazing film Weather Woman, which we should also review. Yes, we should. I love that film. Did we get that back from? Yes. Oh, damn straight we oh. got that back. Okay, good. And if there's ever a Blu-ray Blu release of that, I'm going to get it. Yes. <laughs> I love that film. Um, Maybe we should do that next. We could. It's been a while. I mean, it's, it's like if a Japanese director had done a John Waters film, it's Weather Woman. And it's the perfect way of describing it. It even kind of has a, uh, a a weird gonzo uh, uh, Max Hedrum vibe to it. Yeah. Oh, very much so. <laughs> All right. Let's keep going through the comments here before we get too off track or start talking about dino saucers. <laughs> I got to come up with something more insane than dino saucers. I know it exists. Homeboys I just from outer space. Homeboys and outer that, space. When you showed me that. mercenaries. <laughs> yes, that show. It's that, like, this exists. That, that was my take, because you showed me that, and I was like. Like, wait, this was on TV. <laughs> In fact, this aired right after Star Trek. <laughs> Not really a question, but a great uh, comment from Elton Voorhees. Yeah, Perfect Blue is something else. It makes you understand how paprika happened. Again, I am very curious about paprika now. We should order it. By the way, uh, I'm sorry, I don't recall who told me to. Uh, I am going to be getting Macross Plus and Macross Zero. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw some uh, preview episodes of it, and dear God, well, I, I have been missing out. Yeah. Okay, so that was the comment. I saw exact change only uh, say paprika was the superior of the two films. That's but why I'm high curious. praise. Yeah, it's like, okay, got to see this now. Thank you. Oh, and there's a lot going on that needs to be paid attention to. It, ma it makes you, like the main character, question everything. Yes. And I just find this one interesting. So, ew, super eye patch wolf gross. So, so you don't really care for an overly sentimental Irishman, uh, <laughs> uh, over, over intellectualizing anime? Okay, what else we got here? Um, okay, Endless Nocturne. I've been seeing the internet's effects on kids a lot lately. Their NPC behavior of spewing memes constantly is terrifying. Indeed it is. But is that really the internet's fault or their parents? Uh, no, it's, it's their... It's not the internet. Actually, I would say followers in general have this problem it's just the internet has made it easier to be able to spew other people's opinions because nobody knows where you got it from so you can yeah. sound like uh like you're smart and intelligent because they don't know who you're parroting because i mean there had always been like the phenomena of uh, like uh, women 
who would get obsessed with soap operas and send hate mail and death threats and sometimes like what syringes or even uh, uh, attack actresses from uh, soap operas. See, I don't count that as NPC um, behavior. Behavior. That's that's fanaticism, and that's flat out not understanding the line between fantasy and reality, which I guess does fit in with this topic. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. The, the women who, the people on the screen, they're not watching a television program. They are voyeurs watching the fucked up lives of other people. And damn it, they are going to uh, butt in just like the nosy neighbor. Uh, you know, if they don't like that, uh, so you know that that John is cheating on Marsha. <laughs> Tomboys from outer space. That I would like to see. Yeah, yeah. I would see that. Uh, that that that'd be a great comic to make. Well, we kind of did see that. It's that British space porn. With the three girls. They weren't, they weren't tomboys. They one were just hoes. Was, one of them was kind of a tomboy. And we've got a completely unrelated comment. <laughs> There's a Rubik's Cube cartoon that was made in the 80s. Owen, I was, I was yeah. around when that was airing, and I'm really sorry I saw it. Even, even as a tiny, tiny child, I knew I was seeing a complete shit cartoon. This is where our age differs. I did see the Pac-Man cartoon, and that was horrendous. That, yeah, that was bad. That was absolutely horrendous. But I did not know, nor did I believe, that there was a Rubik's Cube. It didn't last very long. No. It was that bad. But I guess I shouldn't be surprised, considering they have tried several times to do a Connect Four film. So Look, the Rubik's Cube cartoon... Was had a shorter lifespan than even the Pac-Man cartoon, which flopped pretty quick. Didn't it have a pilot, and that's about it? No, no, it aired a few. Oh, it did. Yeah. Wait, didn't they? For me, I want to think they may have aired it during the uh, uh, Super Mario Super Fun Time no, hour. I have no <laughs> idea. Look, look, damn it! I'm old enough to remember Kid Video, okay? Yeah, and actually yeah. liked it when I was a kid. But uh, anyway. Well, um, if it was like kid songs, yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was kind of an Alice in Wonderland tale where a band called Kid Video gets sucked into the rock video world. Oh, that Kid Video. Okay, yeah, you showed me that. Um, okay, well, I, I th oh, <laughs> you, you've seen it too, Chicken Soup. Good for you. <laughs> That's kind of, apparently that, uh, very, very little of that series exists anymore. It all got destroyed. I think there's like one episode. Of, oh, of Kid, Kid Video? Video. Uh, it kind of depresses me. I want. I looked for it once online. Yeah, I think that's the one that you showed me was uh, yeah. that, that one episode. With Master Blaster. Yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I think we've kind of... I Spy Guy. Kat, Ishii, why is childhood so hard for writers to deal with? Are you meaning that I have a hard time dealing with my childhood or as a hard time writers writing childhood? Um... I can say, as far as why is it hard for writers to deal with childhood, um, I wouldn't say that's universal. I mean, there are certainly people who had great childhoods. I, mine just sucked. I mean, growing up in the 80s was cool. There was a lot to like, but I've got to admit, as my home life, that sucked ass. That was just terrible. And the worst part is, is when you're a kid, you don't know your home life is shit. Yeah. It's only when you leave and you find a sane situation, you look back and say, fuck, what the hell was going on in my household? Well, it's kind of like, you know, watching uh, Muppet Babies and seeing how a uh, nanny had them locked up in a room 24-7, occasionally walking in to throw bits of food at them. And when I was a kid, thinking that was totally and completely normal, because that was my life at that time. <laughs> uh, I spy guy. No, writing childhood. Uh I would say probably the reason being is that people all have different, um, we all look at our childhood through different lenses, and there definitely is, there's always a certain class of people or a certain segment of people that had a great childhood, and they only look back on it as it being wonderful, and you get a very rosy portrayal. Or you get people like me who really didn't care for their childhood, and the portrayal is probably just completely vile and inaccurate as to just how ugly it is. I mean, you, you're looking through the, 
you know, as a child, your perception, you're still very clouded with the concept of magical thinking. So you, you may remember a lot of events, but they're not seen correctly. You're seeing them partly as dream almost, or, you know, you don't have the, uh, all the circuitry in your head wired quite right to really put things together or deduct what's really going on or certain things that now as an adult, you know, would be ludicrous seem to make sense as a child. Um, I would say it's probably primarily distance. Um, also, I think it's just very impossible or very difficult for people to um, capture that magical thinking and when everything was still new. I mean, when I think back to my childhood, that's always something I try to remember is everything felt so goddamn new. I'd never experienced that. Um, this is going to be uh, kind of a weird side track here, but one thing that kind of blew me away uh, with, with owning rats, yes, we're going here again, was, you know, they're intelligent enough to remember, they're, they're, they're intelligent enough to actually... Do you need one for inspiration? No. <laughs> um, to have experiences and remember them. They remember, what, they have extremely good memories and they uh, can deduct, uh, deduce things. So you can actually have the joy of introducing a rat to all sorts of new things for the first time. And in seeing that, I started to realize, yeah, okay, I remember that as a kid, the first time I experienced that. And that magic can never be recaptured. For me, reading manuscripts of that writers have sent uh, where the main characters are kids, whether it's third person or first person, one thing that I've noticed is that, one, a lot of inexperienced writers think children equal dumb. Yeah. And so they will write the kids as being dumb. And, um, or, you know, innocent to the point of being dumb. And that's just not true. Kids are not dumb. They're, they're, I would say the best way to approach writing kids is write them like adults who are inexperienced. And what I mean by that is they still have thoughts and ideas and, and will react to things that you throw at them. But since they don't have the experiences that adults do, they're not going to react the same way. You know, if they if they've never come across a bully before, and you know a, a bully comes and punches them in the face and takes their bike, they're not going to react to that the same way an adult would. They won't know what to do, especially if it's the very first time that this has happened to them in their life, like they've moved to a new neighborhood, or you know, just you know, for one reason or another, they're interacting with people in a new way. So don't write your kids like they're dumb R write them like normal people it's just without the experiences the other thing i would also say uh, you were gonna no, keep say, going. no the the other thing that i would say is um try not to write kids as real kids and what i mean by that is as writers you're telling a story so writing normal kids would be really annoying it's really annoying and really boring you don't want your story to be about a kenny y you want your story to be about an interesting little person basically um and whether it's a a main character or a supporting character especially if it's a supporting character you do not want a kenny so don't try to write them as realistic children Try to write them as interesting people, again, without the experiences. Cat, what's a Kenny? What's a Kenny? Okay, you want me to explain a Kenny? The audience might not know what a Kenny is. Okay, a Kenny, the term Kenny comes from, specifically from kaiju films. Well, it comes from Gamera. Yeah, and more specifically from Gamera films. And the Kenny is the, uh, the child character who... Um, is the smart ass who knows it all, who uh, also known as a uh, quote general child, who knows it all, who, who has all the answers, who has all the facts, who, who, who's too smart for their own good, um, is, is, the, is too perfect, too sweet, 
uh, too cute and just plain so fucking annoying. You want to kick this kid's ass and, you know, send them crying home because you just can't stand being around them. You don't want your characters being like that. You, you want your children to be just, you know, people. Uh, actually, a great example of this is in, oh, was it Godzilla, King of the Monsters? The, the, the character that the girl who played Eleven played. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, was, that was King of the Monsters? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, the, the, the girl who played Eleven, I don't remember what the actress's name is. I loved the fact Millie that- Millie Bobby Brown. Millie Bobby Brown? Okay, cool. <laughs> wow. Um, I loved her portrayal because that character should have been annoying as hell. And instead, she played her perfectly as just a, a, a young girl who you know, finds herself in a situation that's way in over her head. And she dealt with it the best way she possibly could as a kid. And I loved that. And it wasn't annoying. And it, it wasn't she just automatically knows how to do things. She's actually freaking out through you know, a good part of it. But, you know, it, she did such a great job. I would say if uh, Millie Bobby Brown can dodge the pitfalls of being a child actor, she may uh, mature into a really good actress. I hope so. Um, so one other thing about writing children, getting back to the magical thinking. And this is my example. It's six years old, childhood magical thinking. Now, we were having something at elementary school where one of the parents had come. It was like a carnival or something. And one of the parents was going, it was the uh, roaming magician who was going to do tricks. And he was doing the pulling quarters out from behind the ears of children thing. Now, as a, a six-year-old, I knew that it couldn't possibly be real. I didn't know how he could possibly be making it happen. It really did look like he was materializing quarters from behind kids' ears. But I knew as a child, it couldn't be. Not because of sleight of hand, because that hadn't quite factored in. The brain was still filling in the gaps of, uh, well, that's how most illusions work, is your brain fills in the gaps with the magical thinking so that you don't see the logical answer. But the reason I knew it had to be fake was, logically speaking, if anyone could materialize quarters, they would be made, they would be a lot richer, and they wouldn't be wandering around a school carnival, doing tricks for elementary school kids in cheap clothing. <laughs> no, that, that's good logic. That was that was childhood logic. That's very good logic. Actually, with that, I read a book where you you did have a magician where they really could material ma create quarters and do it but they could only do it making it look like it appeared out of either somebody's ear or some other place and they had a limited number that they could do per day <laughs> and but that was how they they made their money <laughs> another one from owen well owen first off yeah if we're going to do any from you it's probably going to have to be guyver first and we'll bring you on for that yes but uh he wants to know if he'll get, he'll get reviews for Guyver, Wicked City, Devil Man, Fist of the North Star, and Bubblegum Crisis. Um, I don't think we're going to do w Wicked City. <laughs> no, if we were to do any of the Wicked Cities, I'd say we'd do the live action one. Oh, that thing's so fucking boring, though. Yeah, but it has, like, fucking pinball. And I do act literally mean somebody fucking a I pinball know. machine. It, it, it's actually dull. It's a slog to get through. Uh -huh. I've seen it. Um, and I will say... I've kind of been itching to go back to Bubblegum Crisis. I used to have a big stack of those VHSs as a teenager. Really? I've never seen Bubblegum Crisis. It's very 80s. Oh, I know it is. It's very, I, very no, 80s. Andrew was really into it. But it's a lot of fun. It, it's yeah. kind of like Sentai meets Cyberpunk. That's cool. Um, really has nothing to do with anything. It's uh, Chicken Sith again showing his cred. Kid video was pro was proto Beavis and Butthead and proto ca um, Captain in with the D and D cartoon concept. Space Ace rocked. Did you know Cubert had a cartoon? My mom threw me me a Pac Man themed birthday in first grade. That's cool. That is cool. I did know about the Cubert cartoon. Did I, she take you to the pizza parlor and let you all like have bags of quarters to play Pac Man? Because those were always the best parties. 
where they hold them at Chuck E. Cheese and you got a big uh, thing of tokens, or the games were free. Shakey's. Sh oh, I, that, uh, I don't know about Shakey's. No, no, the Shakey's by my house was great. The ones in, in Riverside were kind of like scary inside. You were looking for the roaches. Oh, no, no. There was there is a Shakey's uh, by my house, and it was two-tiered. And the second tier was where all the, uh, the the games were. Oh, that place was so cool. All right. So we've spent about a half hour, maybe a little more, reviewing a film and a half hour talking about random shit and writing. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I'm having fun here, I think we're going to shut this down for the night. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing at Chicken Sith. Uh, he's a showbiz pizza in 1982. <laughs> I never got to experience that, but everyone who went there said it was way better than Chuck E. Cheese. See, yeah, and California, we didn't have showbiz pizza. Oh, we did. They were just fewer and in weird locations. Well, when by the time I was of age, uh, showbiz pizza didn't exist. Yeah, it had been because, bought out. Yeah, because of the uh, split with the company, and all we had was Chuck E. Cheese. Although I will say the Chuck E. Cheese of, of when I was a kid was a lot better than it is now. And oh, it's, there were all a lot better when we're. Yeah, and it, it's not simply because of uh, childhood nostalgia. Thinking back, no, the the pizza wasn't cardboard. <laughs> and the uh, animatronic still worked. Oh, the animatronic, they, were, they moved more. They didn't just, yeah. you know, rotate side to side. All right. Well, um, one other thing I'm going to point out is that uh, since it is uh, now the year of the plague, with everybody stuck at home, I think we're going to do more of these live casts. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to we're going to try and do these movie reviews on a regular basis. Yes, actually my uh my job has ordered everybody to uh, work from home for the next month. So, uh so that means uh definitely more opportunities for content. Um so we're going to definitely make more content. Mm -hmm. Uh sorry that we're not going to be able to do long form videos. It's just I'm writing full time now. Cats breaking into a new job. Yeah. There just isn't time to do long long form. We can just sit down and chat with you guys. And actually, point blank, I really like the format of just firing up uh, the stream and talking to you and answering your questions and interacting. I like that too, actually. If, if there was any way to do actual live call-ins where we could get you to talk to us for a little bit, like a radio show, I would love a way to do that. So if there's a way to make that happen, if there's a program, let me know on Twitter. Uh, DM me. So you want to say good night? Uh, totally. Uh, one more quick question. All right, one quick question. Quick uh, comment. I do too, Kronk. Uh, completely random. Just going back to uh, Showbiz Pizza. There is an amazing documentary on Showbiz Pizza for anybody who's interested in it, uh, where you find out uh, where the creator is today, uh, what happened to the company, just and where some of the insane fans went, because that's the other part of the, the puzzle that's hilarious. So uh, go check that out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, this has been absolutely wonderful. Again, we plan on doing this again very, very soon. Um, and, uh, yes, thank you all for uh, joining us on your uh, Saturday night. And feel free to dump as many suggestions as you'd like for us to watch. Yes. And do not limit them strictly to Japanese films. We have a lot of things on our list. In fact, um, even though I, the field isn't uh, there for it, go ahead and use the field on the night editor, um, nighteditor.com uh, website to suggest films and hit either Ishii or I up on Twitter with suggestions. Uh, we definitely want to hear your suggestions and uh, continue to hit us up with uh, writing questions too. Now go buy t-shirts in my books. Yes. Thank you all. Have a great night.